Chairman Garrett, thank you so much for being with us today. I just wanted to go through this PowerPoint presentation that I watched you give in one of the committee meetings a week or two ago. I really felt like it was a great overview of where we are tax-wise in Alabama. It was a lot of information that I did not realize. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and I just want you to kind of go through and show us where we are in Alabama when it comes to taxes. Well, thank you for the opportunity to do this. I think that uh, uh, it's important to have this discussion. Our, our tax situation is very complicated. A lot of what we do and what we don't do is limited by our constitution. There's a lot of movements around the state right now, particularly with all the states having budget surpluses to make tax cuts. And I want to kind of talk to you about Alabama, where we currently are, what those opportunities are for us to maybe look at permanent tax cuts going forward, but also be mindful of kind of, you know, where we are just looking at the data. I'm a, as you know, a career CFO. So first thing I want to do is understand the data. The data that I'm presenting is the data that's provided by the Tax Foundation, which is a data source that most people use to, um, the, many of your constituents will be familiar with their, their reports, but they basically have do an annual report and they analyze all the taxes, all the taxes for all the 50 states. So what I've done here is take this, that Tax Foundation book for 2023 and have basically shown what that data would represent. And what I've done is to show Alabama's taxes and revenues, and I've also compared those to Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, and Tennessee, which are the surrounding states, and Texas, because there's a lot of positive um, fiscal things that come out of Texas, and that tends to be a benchmark. So on these charts, you'll see Alabama's um, point in red, and Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Texas in yellow. So let's go to the next slide. The first thing is that we look at income per capita by state. And when you put things on a per capita basis, that basically is making the data comparable. If you take just raw data, New York, for example, would have maybe a $20 million number. In Alabama, that number might be a million dollars. So compared to the two of those, uh, you need to put it on a per capita basis to make sure that you're understanding you know, that you have apples to apples. So basically on per capita, which is by the individual, Alabama, you can see, is one of the lowest income per capita in the country. We have a higher poverty rate than most states, and uh, this chart certainly indicates that. You can see that Mississippi is the only state in our peer group that has a lower income per capita than Alabama. When you go to the next slide, when you look at the state and local tax burdens per capita as a percentage of income, so you can see here that we're a little bit higher as a terms of our percentage of tax burden, but that would, uh, and we'll, we'll get more into the data here, but you can still see that we're kind of at the, uh, not out of line, certainly at the lower end of this terms and of this, of this chart in terms of where we stand as far as tax burden as a percentage of capita, uh, a per percentage of income. But again, we are one of the lower income in the country. So that chart, this kind of chart indicates that. Next slide. So when you look at all the states, where do they get their tax collections? All states have taxes. Where do they get them? The chart on the left shows you that in the United States, the breakdown between property taxes in blue, general sales taxes in orange, individual income taxes in gray, corporate income tax in yellow, and then the other taxes are in green. So you can see here that when you look at the average, you can see that Alabama looks uh, like we have a lot less of our collections as percentage of our collections come from property taxes. Looks like on average, we have higher sales taxes, income taxes and, and uh, corporate income taxes look to be about similar to what the average for the state. And you can see that other category, we seem to be higher than the national average. So let's go to the next slide. When you take these slides, though, and you look at our peer group, the slide on the left, the chart on the left, is the what you just saw before, the, the national average, which nationally about 34% of states, of, of, in, of revenue sources from states come from property taxes. In Alabama, you can see that we're about 17%. So we're about half the national average in terms of where we how much of our revenue comes from property taxes. If you look at the charts, the next chart is Tennessee. And you can see that it has higher property tax collections. Mississippi has higher percentage of their revenue comes from property taxes. Georgia higher, Florida higher. And you look at Texas and, uh, and you know, Texas almost uh, over a third, almost four, over 40% of their revenue comes from property taxes. They don't have income taxes. 
for either individual or sales taxes, but you can see that they make up for it in terms of their property taxes. So this chart just indicates where the states get their revenue, you know, as a, from what tax sources. And if you look at this chart for Alabama, you can see that we look low relative to everyone on property tax. We look a little bit high on the other tax category. So let's go next and delve into each of these categories. When you look at property taxes, Alabama is number 49 in terms of the property taxes paid as a percentage of the of the value of the home. In other words, how you how much do we assess to collect taxes? We're number 49. The only state that that has a lower assessment rate than Alabama is Hawaii. They have a much higher property values, so they have a lower rate. But when you look at the, you can see here that we, we assess a very low percentage, much lower than, the, than most other states. Next chart shows you actually the state and local property tax collections per capita. And we are number 50 and number 50 pretty by, by, by substantial margin. You can see that all the other states have higher property tax collections per capita than Alabama. Uh, the next one closest to us would be Tennessee. No, go back. I'm sorry. would be Tennessee. Mississippi, you can see their property tax collections are, are, are higher than ours. And then, of course, Georgia and Florida significantly. And then look at Texas over to the left. They're substantially higher than ours in terms of property taxes. Next, sales taxes. Now, this is the sales and local sales tax rate. If you look at that black line that runs across, that's where Alabama is on the state sales tax rate. We're at 4%. And you can see there's only one state that's lower than 4%. And that's Colorado. They're there somewhere kind of about the over the third to the left there, you see Colorado. So we have the lowest sales tax rate in the country except for Colorado. Now you notice to the far left, there are several states, Delaware, Montana, New Hampshire, Oregon, and Alaska that don't have um, state sales tax rates. But but for those that do, we have the second lowest. You can see the green though shows the local sales tax rate. And we have one of the higher local sales tax rate um, in the country. Now, part of that is because our constitution, not part of it, primarily our constitution limits the ability of local entities to raise ad valorem taxes, raise property taxes, but they get, we, they have the latitude to raise sales taxes. So that's what's happened is they make up for that not, uh, inability to raise property taxes with increase in sales taxes. So we are one of the higher combined sales tax rate, but that's mostly at the local level. The next chart would show you the uh, general sales tax collections per capita. And this is collection. So the previous chart was rates. And when you gotta be careful when you look at the rates and the collections, the rate is a, maybe a high rate applied to a lower tax base would yield a lower tax collection. Uh, you may have a state that has a low rate, but a broad tax base would have a higher tax collection. So you can see here, despite the fact that we have um, you know, the, 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 this, this is the state sales tax rate part charted here. So we have the lowest state sales tax rate. You see our base is, is low as well, because we're pretty, one of the lower state tax collections per capita. Next chart. This is when you add in the locals, you see that, that here's where when you have the state and local sales tax collections per capita, we, we move up higher. So we we have, we're still on the lower end of the curve, but we are higher. But again, some of the states have a broader base. Tennessee, for example, has a lower combined rate, but they have a broader base. They tax services and things that we don't include in our tax base in Alabama. Next chart. This is just sales tax by county. And again, our sales tax, this is the rate, the sales tax rate by county. And again, you got to be mindful. You're talking about rate and the base. And those previous shots, slides show you where we are on both of those. Next, individual income taxes. Some states don't have, indiv have individual income taxes. Uh, you can see that to the left, uh, on the right side of the screen there, three of our peer states, Tennessee, Florida, and Texas, do not have income taxes. Now, again, you recall earlier, they, they don't have income taxes, but they have higher property or higher sales or other, other taxes in terms of their revenue sources. But, when, but in Alabama, 65% of our education trust fund is related to income tax. So you can see here that even though there's some states that don't have it, for the states that do have individual income tax collections per capita, we are on the low end of the curve. Mississippi would be lower on the income tax collection. Of course, Georgia is higher. And again, three states don't have it. Next chart. 
state and local individual income tax collections. Some states have local individual income taxes. We don't in Alabama. So we still here on the low end of the curve for the states that do. Uh, you can see that, again, Florida and Texas and Tennessee. Tennessee has a slight local uh, blip there. But um, the, anyway, we're, this is where we are on the, on the individual income tax collections. But again, this is 65% of our budget. We are heavily dependent upon individual income taxes and on sales taxes. And both of those are volatile. Property taxes tend to be more stable. So when property values go up they, and the assessments go up, the property taxes tend to be more stable. Individual income tax and sales taxes fluctuate wildly with the economy. So when, when, when times are good, you have good collections, they fall off the cliff pretty quick. And of the, of the two sales tax and income tax, the more volatile is income tax. And of course, we're heavily dependent upon that. Next chart. Corporate income taxes, again, you see to the right, some states don't have income tax, uh, corporate income tax, Texas being one, Alabama does. And here on the in tax, income tax collections per capita, we're right here in the in the uh, the center of kind of on the lower end though compared to most states. Next. And when you look at local corp, state and local corporate income tax collections, so the state portion and the local portion, we're uh, still on the lower end of the curve for those states. And only one of our peer states has a lower income tax collection for corporate, and that's Georgia. Of course, Texas doesn't have one. Next. When you look at other taxes, and this is where it gets interesting because you have these other um, taxes that impact our budgets. Uh, one would be the state cigarettes excise tax. We have one of the lower state excise taxes in the country. Next. Cell phone taxes, we're right here sort of on the lower end of the midpoint of the curve there, but not really out of line with other states on the state and local sales phone tax rates. Next. Gasoline tax rates. <clears throat> now you can see here that, and I want to talk a little bit about this. You can see the blue is the state sales tax rate and the, the green is the other um, taxes and fees. Alabama is really in the midpoint in terms of gasoline taxes. Our rate's 28 cents. And um, you can see where we compare. You see that other state sales taxes, Tennessee, Texas, and Mississippi have lower state sales tax rates on gasoline taxes. Go to next chart. Now, Alabama had not raised the sale, the gasoline tax for 27 years. And we're in an economy right now where you see how the impact of inflation. So just in the last couple of years, you know, prices have gone up because people are having to charge more to provide their services because to keep up with the cost of what they're buying. Well, for 27 years in Alabama, we did not increase the gasoline taxes. And in Alabama, 100% of our road fund is funded by gasoline taxes either gasoline taxes or the federal funds that match those gasoline taxes. You can't take general fund money or education trust fund money and move it to the, to the road fund, that it must come from this. So we had a model that basically said, we're not going to increase revenue going to that fund, except for as population grew and as more gasoline was consumed, those gasoline tax dollars would go into that. But it, they did not, they, they were static. They didn't fluctuate. Words, it's not like a sales tax where if the price of gas is $3, you pay more for gasoline tax than the price is $2. Gasoline tax is just fixed. It's per gallon. So what happened was that we got to the point where gasoline, um, where, where, Lit cars had gotten more fuel efficient, so the miles per gallon were improving, and we got to the point that the population stabilized and we weren't growing, and in fact, that gasoline fund was declining. And that's when the point, when the we passed the gasoline tax after 27 years. And the effect of that was a 10 cent increase, which if you take a per, the average, you know, a person who drives 15,000 miles per year, an average of 20 miles per gallon, um, that would cost people $75. Collectively, though, that was $320 million that we could add to the road fund. Uh, when you take the 28 cent total tax, which prior to that, it was 18 cents. Now that you got the 28 cents, it costs the consumer in total for all the taxes $210 a year. And that's almost a billion dollars, though, in road money. And that's why you've seen since the passes of tax, you've seen rebuild Alabama signs all over the state because we now had the money to go in and actually fix roads, repair roads, rather than just kind of patch repair them. Go to the next chart. This one here, though, indicates that when you look at the average gas price by state, even though we're like in the midpoint of the gasoline taxes, you can look and see that this, this chart was done on 9-7. Um, this, I check this every day. This is, comes from gasbuddy.com. It compares the, the gas price 
per state. And Alabama is 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 at this point was I think number forty four had the forty fourth lowest gas price all in in the country, even with the gasoline tax. Now you look and see that all the southern states, Texas, Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana. Uh, uh, Oklahoma, Georgia, Tennessee, South Carolina, I mean, all those Southern states have lower all-in gas prices. That has to do with our gas supply, our location, our, our able to tap into the supply of gas. So even with the gas tax higher, you can see that we have one of the lower all-in gas prices. Typically, we're going to be number, uh, I've, I look at this chart, you know, pretty much every week to see how where we stand. We're usually between number 42 and number 46 in terms of all-in gas price. So that's just interesting. But with that catch up, though, that allowed us to go ahead to the next chart to put the money to spend roads. And when you look here at the share of state and local road spending covered by the state. That's only 34 percent. Only 34 percent of the roads we build in Alabama are covered uh, by the state. And that means we are getting a lot of matching funds or a lot of local funds coming in. You know, the local funds, but primarily it's the federal match. So. That's all to say that, again, this is just data, but it indicates that in terms of gasoline taxes, you know, we're not out of line with other states. In fact, our all-in price, we're still lower than other states. Next chart. But that's the only mechanism we have for bill roads. One of the other taxes, now we get into the alcohol taxes. You're going to see here we're on the upper end of the curve here. Alabama is, is, has a higher al alcohol tax. Uh, this is for state spirits. Uh, the state, state spirit tax rates. In Alabama, we actually had, uh, tax alcohol twice, the excise tax and then also the sales tax. So we have one of the higher because of state control. When you look at wine, by the way, you look at Tennessee here too, you can see that Tennessee is um, on the pretty low on that, that spirit tax. They're, they're on the low end. Now on the wine excise tax rate, you go to the next chart, wine excise tax rate, we're still higher uh, you see Tennessee has kind of moved up to the to closer to being higher. They're still pretty low. When you look now at the next chart, which is the beer excise tax rate, Tennessee has the highest beer excise tax rate. So they, they don't tax liquor and wine so much, but they tax beer. I'm suspicious that has to do with the Jack Daniels lobby or some of the, the, those type things here. But in Alabama, we don't tax beer as much as others. But you can see that we are definitely higher taxes on these on these alcohol taxes in other states. Next chart. Next chart. When you take all the tax collections per capita that we talked about, the, the property sales, income, corporate income, other taxes, you put all of those together and look at state and local tax collections per capita, we are number 49 on as part of the tax foundation. We have the uh, tax class per capita, we're number 49. Now, Tennessee is slightly lower than us. You should have a little asterisk there beside that, though, because Tennessee also has a lottery. And when they, you get the lottery from the taxpayers, lottery from the citizens. So when you throw the lottery revenue in, t Tennessee actually has more income more tax collections or more collections from its citizens in Alabama. But the point of this is even with, with all the push about, yes, we have an income tax, but we have low property taxes. We have this, other states don't have this, but when you put them all together, we are a low tax state. In fact, you can argue the lowest tax state in the country. So we are looking over the past several years, the legislature has been diligent in making some modest tax cuts and trying to address some permanent tax reductions that are targeted to specific in individual groups that might need some relief. But you understand that we're at the lowest, we're starting at a low point already. So the lower you go, now you're going to at some point get the fact we're, we're going to not be able to uh, compete effectively with the surrounding states. All right, next chart. This just shows you I'm not advocating for a lottery, but the fact is that the surrounding states do have a lottery. This chart here just shows that in the United States, there's about $26 billion of lottery collections. Of course, Alabama has none. Go to the next chart and just look at the uh, lottery revenue uh, with the surrounding states. You see Alabama has zero. Mississippi has, I think, about $80 million of lottery collections. Their lottery money goes into the road fund, which that's how they're, they're looking to build roads off of their lottery money. Tennessee has a half a billion dollars of lottery revenue in 2021. Uh, Georgia had one and a half billion. Texas had almost had two billion. And Florida had two and a half billion. So you look at those so you go back to those previous charts where you had the Alabama low tax state, and then you had those others always had higher tax collections per capita. You can add to that to their numbers additional lottery revenue that we don't have, and that money goes into their budgets. All right, next chart. When you look at debt per capita, 
Alabama is is a low debt per capita state. So even if you start from the standpoint, we're a poor state, we have a lower income collections per capita. And then you look at, we have a low, one of the lower tax burdens per capita, among the tax collections per capita. We've managed to do this with also still having pretty low debt relative to other states. Next chart. Uh, the state and local debt per capita is the same. We're on the, we're on the low end of the curve there. So we uh, think that's that's good. Some of just tax policy information here. This recently, in recent years, we increased the standard deduction and exemption for taxpayers who made less than $50,000. We did that last year. That provided tax relief. Also last year, we exempted $6,000 per person for a person over age 65 who's withdrawn from a defined contribution plan. So if you if you are withdrawn from your 401k, your IRA, it's a defined contribution plan. Previously in Alabama, they taxed, we taxed all of that, uh, not defined benefit plans. So but we exempted the first 6,000 per individual, so 12,000 a couple. And we're talking this year about increasing that another 4,000. So we'd be 10,000 or 20,000 a couple. That's tax relief. We eliminated the minimum business privilege tax next year, which affects a lot of small businesses. We exempted last year, the first 40,000 of business, business personal property taxes from taxes, which was a savings for 75% of small businesses in the state. We exempted all the CARES and ARPA funds, all of COVID relief money, all of that was exempted from taxes. Go to the next chart. Um, we also reduced unemployment compensation payments from six months to 13 weeks. That was costing employers, you know, they have to pay the unemployment. So we, we, we reduced the unemployment uh, benefits by the state by over half. And then we also increase the job search requirements where you have to look three times a week. Previously, it was once a week. We changed the apportionment calculation. This is a difficult, this is a complicated deal. But basically, prior to this change, what happened was if you were a business and you, a small business or a business, any business, and you were located in Alabama and you sold, had revenue from Alabama sources and also revenue from outside the state, then the people outside the state paid less Alabama tax rate than the people who, and then the, then, then your rev, the, the revenue from that you sold outside the state was was the revenue you sold in Alabama was taxed higher than somebody who was outside the state selling into Alabama. We flipped that now so that if you're located in Alabama and you sell into Alabama, you're taxed lower than somebody who's located out of the state selling into Alabama. That that was a complicated change. Then we did several other things that 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 allowed for tax relief uh, because we're tied to the federal law. When the federal tax code changes, we automatically follow suit. And sometimes that works to our disadvantage. We we eliminated those disadvantages here in this in those in the last couple of years. Senator Roberts and I carried those bills. The next chart. So if you look at Alabama, basically we're the lowest property taxes in the United States, the second lowest state sales sales tax tax, the second lowest tax collections in the state, or arguably the lowest tax collections in the state if you take Tennessee's lottery uh, uh, change. Um, we have the second lowest state sales tax rate in the United States. We do have the highest local sales tax rate, but we don't include services. So our base is narrower than some of those that have lower rates. And then we also do have high alcohol tax fees. Next chart. Um, we're middle tier on gasoline taxes, but we have one of the lowest price per gallons per gasoline. And that's the only, again, the only source of road funding. We don't have gaming revenue and we do have constitutional restraints and restrictions on how we can adjust tax rates and changes. There's some things we, it's easier said than done. Now I want to look at some of the more comparative analysis I think is interesting. One, if you take a look at, at the equivalent state dollars, a lot of people will say to us, well, you know, Florida just cut taxes a billion dollars implying that we should do the same. Well, if you look at Alabama and you look at our population and look at the budgets and expenditures for those other states, then you kind of look and say that $150 million in Alabama would be the same as almost $900 million in Texas. So last year when we cut the, te the taxes cuts we did last year were about $180 million, $160, $180 $160, million. That would have been pretty significant if Texas had done that thing relative to where they are. That would have been almost a billion dollars in tax cuts. When you look at a billion dollars um, in Alabama, that's about four and a half billion in Florida and six billion, almost six billion in Texas. And you don't see them cutting taxes at that rate. Yeah, they're cutting a big number, but bring it back to Alabama dollars. It's it's basically kind of what we're doing. Next chart. 
when you look at the income tax comparison too, we're the only state that allows you to deduct your federal income taxes against your state income taxes. So Missouri is on a, is has a has had a lot of publicity because they're cutting their individual income tax rate. Uh, down below 5% to 4.75%. I want to say this too. If you go back to the property tax discussion, a lot of states who have high property taxes have this windfall right now because their property taxes have gone up. Everybody's property tax collections are up because property values are up so dramatically. The states that have high property taxes, though, have a huge windfall. So that gives them a source to be able to go here and chip away at some of the other things. In Alabama, you know, we do have a little bit of a windfall, but we don't have a lot to chip away at because we're already, as you say, you know, it, we, we have we're constrained and, and 65 percent of our income of our uh, education budget because of income taxes. And you can see we're already kind of not on the high end of that. And all in, we're one of the lower tax states. So that windfall we don't have that other states have. But let's take Missouri. They're going to cut it. They got one hundred thousand dollars of taxable income. Say an individual had one hundred thousand dollars. And they don't have any federal income tax deduction. So their state tax base is $100,000. If you apply that 4.75%, which they're going to get to in four or five years, they're going to pay a tax of $4,750. $4, in Alabama, if your taxable income is $100,000, uh, LFO tells me that your federal tax would have been on average $17,000, which means your Alabama tax base, you can deduct that. So it would be $82,000. At our 5% rate, you're going to pay four four thousand one hundred dollars, which is less than what Missouri will be in five years when they cut, you know, below a quarter point rate. So this goes back to the rate and the base argument I talked about earlier. We did pass out of the House this past week a bill that will reduce that five percent down to four point nine five percent. That's not a whole lot of money, but optically it's it's below five percent. It does provide some tax relief, but we have that federal income tax deduction. Um, that's something we that 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 is we're the only state that does that now. And Did so that when pass the federal tax, no, no, just it's just passed the House at this okay. point. It's uh, passed the Senate committee, but it's not passed the House yet. Um, there's a Senate version and a House version. The Senate version passed the Senate committee. It's not been on the floor yet. But when you look at federal tax income taxes, when federal income taxes go up, that increases the amount of your deduction on your Alabama return. When federal income taxes go down, it increases your Alabama taxes. That's some of that fix that Senator Roberts and I did last year was some of those chases. We want to make sure that, that that didn't happen in some of those specific cases. But just generally, because we're tied to that federal movement, that's that's that can be a problem for us or a windfall for us. But it, it, it affects your, your predictability. The other thing is Parka did a report um, this summer that said if you took the tax structures that are currently in place in Mississippi, and replaced Alabama's tax structure with what Mississippi's structure would be, that Alabama's surplus this year would be $1.1 billion higher. So in other words, if you took the Mississippi tax structure and said, Alabama, throw out yours, pay taxes as if you were Mississippi, had Mississippi's taxes, our $2.8 billion surplus would be $3.9 billion. This speaks to the fact that where we are on the, on the, as a low tax state. If you took the same thing for Florida and took the Florida tax structure, imposed that on Alabama, our surplus today would be $1.5 billion more. If you took Georgia, it'd be $1.6 billion more. So this just kind of validated what we had, what the data shows us is that we are a low tax state. Go to the next chart. This, this is, is a, yeah, the green one. Yeah. Oh, the the next one. Yeah. So what this is, Moody's did a stress test. So they took all the states and they said every state's got a surplus. They have rainy day accounts. They have uh, you know savings accounts, whatever they have. And they basically looked at all of those. Alabama, you can see we're in the red. So we're kind of in the top, I would say the top third. Uh, Tennessee, Florida, and Texas are higher. So they have more rainy day balances, more surpluses than we have. And what they did, this chart, you, if you zoom, yeah, you don't do it now, but later you just want to study it. They basically said if we if we modeled a moderate recession, how would the state come out given their current situation? And we're basically going to be number 20 in terms of our performance after a recession. So we're still going to have at the, if, if that were to happen, we would end up with a um, total surplus with in rainy day funds of about 13 percent. Texas is going to have 27 percent, Florida, 30 percent, Tennessee, 31 percent. So. Even though we do have this big surplus, other states have surpluses, 
And given all the revenue sources, the modern the recession, they're going to have even larger surpluses than we're going to have now. Some of the states below us are going to be in tight, it's going to be tight. Georgia, for example, would only end up with a surplus of about 6%. Uh, Mississippi would actually be underwater in a negative situation there. So that speaks to the fact, I think, that low income level in the state, low tax rate in the state, low debt in the state. We balance our budgets every year. We've done these modest tax cuts going forward. Well, yes, we have reserve, reserves and surplus like other states, but the limits that we have basically on what we borrowed and you know, our, our running day, day funds have been paid back pretty much. We are now you know, in a, in a pretty good spot, which is a fiscally conservative, responsible place to be. Next chart. Um, now, this is a chart where I just I listed through a bunch of third party comments. These are people that say that, like, for example, when it comes to spending, we're bluer than New York and California. That's a sound bite. That's just not true. Um, you can go on down and see that, you know, that we that, uh, some of these are just sound bites I lifted to say, guys, this is what kind of you get spun in the media. But the data doesn't show that. Go, keep flip on through, Becky. I can't remember what's at the very end here. Going through, going down. Keep going. Keep going. These are just a bunch of just comments that mm -hmm. talk about. Yeah. Now there's Standard and Poor's that basically has analyzed this and talks about that part of the reason that we are able to be that they complement the budget processes and the guardrails and restraints we've had and how that speaks to the good credit quality we have. You go to the next point, the Parker report, which talked about uh, uh, everybody says you ought to be like Tennessee, I'll be like Florida, I'll be like so and so. And again, if we were, we'd be paying more taxes. Because, you know, I know Ron DeSantis was here a few weeks ago and he made a comment, you know, you ought to get rid of the income tax for it. You, you ought to try it. Everybody applauded. That's great. But that's 65 percent of our budget. So what he didn't say was get rid of income tax and raise your property tax. Yeah, you know, that's what he, that was the other side we left out. Um, it, anyway, these these comments just speak. Keep on going to the end. I'm not <laughs> sure if that's what the last keep going there. Um yeah. Okay. Now, on, so so basically, let's 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 stop right here. So basically, uh, we'll go back one chart, Becky. Go back one chart. Okay. Now, so so all that to say that we are a low tax state, and the facts show that maybe the lowest tax state, and we're continuing to chip away and 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 do those things because we are growing. We're we're as we grow and the budgets grow, we want to, you know, we want to. Uh, uh, have to continue to be a low tax state. That's good. But you hear some people will say, well, look at all that. And they'll say, well, yeah, but you're number 41 in business climate. And that's what the tax foundation report says that you're number 41 in business climate. Now I'm scratching my head going, we've got Mercedes, Hyundai, all steel, you know, all these, how can we number 41? Well, if you look at this climate index, here's what it says. The tax foundation state business time index is an indicator of which state's tax systems are most hospitable to business and tax growth. The index does not purport to measure economic opportunity or freedom or even the broad business climate, but rather the narrower business tax climate and its variables reflect this focus. Go to the next chart. They basically take the taxes and they weight them. And they have a, it's an academic exercise. They say, if you have an individual income tax, that's a 30% weight. Sales tax is a 23% weight. Property tax is only 50%, 15% weight. So where we have very low property taxes, you know, in the, in the income, we get the lowest weighting in their formula. If you look at what they say over here to the right, they say weighting improves the explanatory power of the state business climate index as a whole, because components with higher standard deviations are those areas of tax law where some states have significant competitive advantages. Businesses that are comparing, state, com comparing states for new or expanded locations must give greater emphasis to tax climates when the differences are large. On the other hand, components in which the 50 state scores are clustered together, closely distributed around the mean, are those areas of tax law where businesses are more likely to, to de-emphasize tax factors in their location decisions. That's a very academic exercise is my point. So their climate, they're basically looking at your tax structure. Do you have an income tax? If you do, that's a, we think that's unhospitable, 30%. So that's what they do. Keep going. So when you look at that, you run it, you can see here that we are number 41 in tax climate. Now, we do have tax incentive programs, the Jobs Act, growing out of other things that we do give, which other, which all states do. That's just part of it. We'll have to take those up bills. You know, this 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 session, we'll be taking those bills up. But so we do offer tax incentives, and some people are opposed to that fundamentally, even though that's kind of the way 
that's done in the in the in the real world. But when you look at that at the uh, just on the service of their tax climate, we're number forty one. But if you look who's number one. According to the, this tax foundation analysis, the number one business climate in the country is Wyoming. Number two is South Dakota. Number three is Alaska. Number four is Montana. Well, number four is Florida. Florida slips in there. Then you've got Montana, New Hampshire, Nevada, Utah. So the point is a lot of these are states where you don't have any a very low population. You don't have any businesses. You don't have any industry. You certainly their business climate being number one is not really helping them, right? So I guess what I'm saying is this, this I think this exercise gets misread. It's an academic exercise more than anything. The proof, I think, to look at your business climate is how many of these states have developed more projects and have more people come to the state than we have. And I think that's been part of our success, even though people, some people don't like giving corporate tax incentives to get these people here. When they come here and we do see revenue growth and it goes in the income taxes and the sales taxes and, 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 and um, the property taxes and things. You can see from the previous slides that we're able to have maintain our status as a low tax state with that growth. All right, next chart. Um, and in the business climate, they show the property tax rank because they give it a low ranking. We're not number 50. They've got us kind of higher up. That's because of their weighting. All right, next chart. Individual income taxes, they've got us higher. This just shows you their weights. The next chart just shows you that their weighting kind of skews what the actual data shows. Keep going up. Okay. Uh, keep going. That oh, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The sales tax rate, go back. Go back. That's, they do have us as the, the, the highest uh, number, number, the worst in terms of sales tax. And, and we do have, you know, but yeah, the data previously shows you, but most of that sales tax we pay is at the local level, not the state level. Mm -hmm. So all that to say, that's the data. And whatever taxes we cut, whatever things we do, just understand we're starting from a point of being number 40, not number 50. Well, I think that is such a great presentation. And it's it's not what I thought of Alabama. I, you know, you hear the sound bites and you don't really see the data. So this was very helpful. Are these slides that, can we publish the, I mean, can we sure. put yeah. these yeah. out? Um, yeah. I, know Becky, I, will, I, will, I will say this, that, you know, our taxes are, are, they're regressive, okay? So if you wanted to look at tax reform, which is a complicated subject, and it gets to the constitutional restraints, you know, if you, if you reduce Again, when you go back and look at where the states get their revenue, they're going to get it from one of those four or five sources. So if you reduce one, they've replaced it somewhere else. When Alabama, if you're going to talk about tax reform, those are the kind of discussions you're going to have to have. And it's 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 true that we do have regressive taxes. You know, um, that's and, and that we're kind of hamstrung by that. We're trying to address that. You know. Ex, you know, every every year we're trying to take a, take a look at how we can help the targeted groups, the people over sixty five, the people of the 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 poorest of the poor. Last year, that tax cut for people making less than fifty thousand. But I'm not arguing against tax reform. That's a big subject. But um, and I'm not defending our tax structure. I'm just saying this is what the data shows. This is this is this is these are the cards we have. Do you see any controversial tax bills coming up this year? Is there anything that's really going to make a lot of waves? Well, so, so you know, there's several grocery tax bills coming yes. up, you know, and uh, the there, you, and you look again and, and you see the data and see what it does. Then you got to look and say, what is it? What is it? What's the impact to the budget? You know, the grocery tax bill that I filed recently was about a $200, $250 million annual impact to the budget. Um, eliminating the entire grocery tax at the state level would be about seven hundred million dollars um, out of the out of the budget, and um, of course you want to make sure that the locals don't replace that reduction because that money doesn't go to the state that would go to the locals. So we got that, that. Then you get then you start getting messing into the local domain, which pretty much we try to give them limited home rule. So those issues come up. Uh, this is why issues that that maybe are not so much tax related, but if they impact the budgets, they would be. For example, um, the, the the school choice bills. You know, I think the school choice is subject to discussion we're, we're having. We're going to continue to have those. Um, uh, but you know, if you talk about taking um, 
you know, a, a bill that might take $500 million out of the education budget. And then say on top of that, we're going to take, you know, uh, another 700 million out of the education budget for um, sales tax, the grocery tax reduction, you're talking over a billion dollars. And then when you look at the data we just went through, what is that? How is that going to impact what we do? You know, how is it going to impact um, life and, and the services we provide? And um, um, so, so I say controversial. I think that um, everybody wants low taxes. Everybody wants lower taxes. And, you know, Republicans believe in low taxes. Um, I think some people that maybe are libertarian more thing believe in no taxes. You know, that's that's a that's a sound bite. But I mean, you know, I think we're we're trying to keep taxes low. And um there are a lot of bills that 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 and again, we're coming up with a with a we started with our starting point is a low income per capita. If we can raise that income per capita, how do you do that? That's how you improve the education system. That's how you can when you can you know, build a workforce and you can do the kind of things we're trying to do. That's why some of those programs are so important to us. Um, so I don't, so the, the controversial things that I've heard about really are the, the various sales tax proposals. Um, and um, I think other bills that might impact the budgets that provide no replacement revenue. How do we deal with that? And I think we're going to have to deal with it because I think some of that stuff's just the way the world's moving. That's why I think ultimately tax reform is something we're going to have to look at because our tax code was written in the 19th century, you know, eight, eight, the 19th, the 20th century. We're now in the 21st century. We've got remote workers. We've got technology. We've got all sorts of different things now that our tax code is kind of locked into what it is. You know, um, that's why the Internet sales tax, you know, which we got to, kind of got ahead of the curve of the state for that. Now, 75% of the internet sales tax goes to the general fund because they were always, they have no growth revenue in the general fund. It's pretty much all the growth revenue opportunities in the education trust fund. So we've done some of that, but those to me are kind of like patches, you know? Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to go through this. I want to ask you one question. What do you think about Will Alabama ever have combined budgets? We're, we're one of the only states that has an education budget and a general fund. And that's very yeah, weird. You know, it's complicated. But do you think that will ever change? Well, that's something that the, the, the answer to that is that will change when it gets on the ballot and the voters say we want to do that. And that's easier said than done. I mean, I mean, I'm a CFO. Yeah, it would make a whole lot of sense to combine all these things. The problem right now, though, is that like, when you look at the on the general fund where they struggle, the other two thirds of the general fund is prisons and Medicaid. So the ultimate question is going to be, do you want to right? And right now the education dollars can't touch either one of those. So the question is going to be ultimately, do you want to combine the budgets and have the opportunity for education dollars to move out of the schools and move into prisons or move into Medicaid? Now, I mean, I'm, we're talking we're talking 300,000 feet level here, right? So that's kind of a big issue. You, you can imagine the conversations around that. Also, you get into these things like Medicaid expansion. Some of the other states that have one budget, a lot of states have expanded Medicaid. You know, we don't want to do that. We, we've, we've talked about that. But you, you there, there's a risk with that right now. And I think that's the concern is going to be that when you've got already ed struggles in the education area, and there are a lot of different ways to address that, uh, combining the budgets may not help that. It puts pressure really on prisons and Medicaid and some of that stuff. And so um, that's, you know, I think practically it makes a lot of sense, but there's some really tough hurdles to get to that point. Well, thank you again for your time. And I will put in the description below, I will have these slides. So if people want to sure. take the time to look through them a little bit closer. It might be easier than trying to do it while the video was going, but I yeah, really sure. do appreciate your time. Sure. Have Absolutely. Thank you. Appreciate okay. you too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.